uh, welcome everybody, uh, all those who've been able to log in. Uh, in the six webinars so far, we've had about uh, 2,000, in fact, over 2,200 people uh, log in, register, participate in our webinars uh, from 138 countries. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's been a great pleasure because uh, people have been very engaged. It's also the first time that in India, you know, organizing something from India, we got so many, so much participation from Africa, from South America, many parts of the world that we often tend to forget because we so focused on, you know, the global north. So this is, these webinars are true blend of global north and global south. And uh, so welcome. Today's webinar theme uh, is very focused. Uh, unlike our previous webinars, because we now established ourselves globally, so we're going to highly specialize in what we are doing. So the theme is art, ephemerality, and performance. Now, Lonnie Bunch Three, you know, sort of uh, the uh, the new uh, secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, he is a historian, the first ever historian to head the Smithsonian. He's also the first ever African-American to head the Smithsonian. And he was uh, the founding director emeritus uh, of uh, the National Museum of African-American History and Culture at the Smithsonian. He started it from scratch. And uh, he sent out a message uh, a few days ago, which was quite interesting. He said the protest with Black Lives Matter, the protest itself is a performance. People are protesting, people are expressing, you know, uh, the, the need for change, the need for racial respect, the need for understanding how we deal with and dismantle colonialism and racism. But the protests are not just by African-Americans in the US, uh, they're predominantly by people of all, diff all other backgrounds. So they're people of color of different backgrounds. They're African Americans, they're Caucasians, Asian Americans, Native <clears throat> Americans, which is unusual in in the United States. So it's a historic moment. He said that. So he wanted people participating in the protests using their smartphones, whatever they're using, to capture the moment of the protest as a performance and send it to the. National Museum of African American History and Culture because they're collecting the moments, the images, the moment that captures both uh, video, audio, uh, 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 photographic, they're capturing them as their collection. But the question that comes, you know, when you capture that something which is performed, aren't you freezing what you capture in that particular point of time, which you are? So you can imagine for collection managers, they have to exactly get the details when the image of performance took place. However, when we talk about performance art, and there are many iterations of it, uh, performance art changes with the, with the iterations. It, it changes with the context of the performance space. It changes with the atmosphere. It changes with the audience, the visitors. It changes with the whole range of other factors. No two iterations of a performance art are the same. And so how do we actually capture, how do we collect performance art in an art museum or a museum? Uh, how do we uh, uh, catalog something of this kind? How do we you know, deal with the ephemerality of it that we've captured permanently? Mm -hmm. And uh, are we really freezing it in time? Is that appropriate? What are the ethics involved in doing that? These are all some of the issues that are coming up, uh, especially in the last few weeks. And uh, also, we often talk about curators. So how do curators curate performance art? You know, the different iterations of it. These are all challenging issues because um, we've got, uh, we got a wonderful panel of people this evening, all the three of them dealing with performance uh, art, either through research or through studying the atmosphere and actually, uh, or actually creating performance art itself. Uh, I'm really delighted to tell you that 
Dr. Ida Bredholt Lunduga from uh, Denmark is with us tonight. Her, she's the senior advisor, uh, a Danish agency for culture and palaces. Uh, uh, Shervili, could you put the spotlight on Ida, please? <laughs> and uh, so that's Ida, you see her. And the senior advisor, Danish agency for culture and palaces in Copenhagen. Uh, one of the most experienced museum people in the Nordic world. But also she was the former head of education. In fact, I should correct myself, she's the former. She was the founding head of education uh, at Louisiana Museum of Modern Art, one of the, uh, if not the, but one of the top art museums in Europe, in Denmark. Then we have Professor Bindu Badana, who did a doctorate from the well-known Carl Jasper Center for Advanced Transcultural Studies at the University of Heidelberg, and uh, which is very famous for intercultural research. And she brings with her a whole depth of experience. And uh, she's now a professor at Anand National University here with us in Ahmedabad. And there is, uh, I present here, Professor Bindu Badana. There she is. And then we have uh, a wonderful, wonderful you know, later, the university uh, later, that's a uh, spotlight on to, uh, yeah, Dr. Ananuya Chaube. Um, people think, okay, he's provost and he's uh, a poet and uh, he's an artist. Well, he's a very well-known artist and uh, he works in a very interesting uh, way. He does those, he, he trans he migrates between poetry, between prose, uh, into the digital domain. He, his art is very much a performance in the digital domain. And once again, the challenge comes, you know, sort of when he's doing this in the digital domain, uh, do we collect it as just digital art or digital performance art? What about the context? Or how do we catalog it, for example? So these are all key issues that come up. So we're going to start off with Dr. Ida Lundega, uh, with focusing on our theme, art, ephemerality, and performance. Each one of our panelists will have about eight minutes, and, and then we're going to have one hour for discussion. So please post your questions uh, in the question and answer box. And, Dr., uh, and uh, Sharvari Mehta, who is the manager of our International Center for Inclusive Cultural Leadership at Anand National University, she will collate them, cluster them, collapse them if necessary, if they're similar questions, and she'll flick them across to me and I will post them to the panelists. So we're all set now to go. Uh, now I would like to invite Dr. Ida Lundgaard to kickstart the evening. Uh, Dr. Lundgaard. Thank you very much. Uh, I am very honored, Professor Gala, to be great of your very inspirational Heritage Matters seminars. And I look so much forward to discuss on the theme art, ephemerality and performance. My argument here is that performance art balance current museum practice because it is ephemeral, situated, site-specific uh, and an embodied art form. I propose atmosphere on understood as an aesthetic and phenomenological phenomenon and the development of atmospheric competence as a strategic tool in the process of documentation of performance art within um, the museum environment. And documenting performance art from the dynamics of atmosphere enables a hybrid museum practice which is holistic and inclusive. It is based on acknowledging diverse and embodied knowledge systems, hereby enhancing museums' advanced knowledge ecology. So the three key points I'm addressing are performance art, atmosphere, and hybrid museology. My research is based on the Serb Serbian body and performance artist Marina Abramovic and the legacy of her 50 years of performance art. Abramovic's nomadic practice embraced a range of knowledge systems and disciplines. She has developed her cosmopolitan 
practice by learning from Aboriginals in Australia, Tibetan Buddhist monks, and the Ombada in Brazil, and from many other people and places all over the world. Abramovich's most recent work expands and amplifies the experience of presence and explores embodied duration. The spiritual and religious dimensions are also important for her performance. She has developed a method of cleaning and purification to be receptive and responsive as aesthetic performative strategy. My engagement with her exhibition 512 Hours at Serpentine Gallery in London 2014 became a turning point for my personal and professional engagement with performance art and museums. The title 512 Hours is referring to the time span of the exhibition and the time Abramovich spent in the three empty spaces constituting the exhibition. The exhibition is about sensory experiences produced by the body in a void space with other people, other bodies. It was carried out without an ethical framework of care. It suggested to me a new practice regarding learning how to learn and thus knowledge production. It was taking place between diverse people in order to experience being in common. The exhibition confirmed and stimulated my interest in the potentials of performance art and co-creating the contextual atmosphere within museum environments. Abramovitz has always been concerned with the legacy of her work. Throughout her career, she documented her work using uh, photography and film. Her documentation has been important for performance become, her performance and performance art becoming mainstream in art museums, uh, together with her exploration of re-performance of historical pieces. Also, her 25 years teaching career constitute an important intergenerational transmission of the legacy of her work. She teaches her Abramowitz method, cleaning the house, as she call it, on how to make durational work of art and to preserve their legacy. Further, she has established Marina Abramovitz Institute of Performance Art, which includes the legacy of the historical performance works. She has also created the Abramovitz method for the public to go through certain exercises in order to be able to focus and concentrate for long durational performances. The ephemerality of performance art concerns the phenomenological being. It confronts the fact that we are always already bodily situated in the world to grasp and learn from the full potential of the performance in a specific environment, I propose to document the dynamics of atmosphere. Understanding atmosphere as an aesthetic and phenomenological phenomenon radiating from the environment and from people. It is an exploration of how bodies influence and are, are influenced by atmospheres within museum environments and how they are conditioned and restricted within the museum environment, as well as how they can be empowered socially. I have a particular focus on collaborative processes to explore the potential of the atmosphere to exceed socioeconomic and cultural differences. And then my last point, hybrid museology. Accordingly, the museum practice that performance art can inspire puts focus on learning how to learn, critical care, multivocality, and complexity. It problematizes clear and fixed distinctions between materiality and intangibility, and it foregrounds the processes of knowledge formation and understandings, thus calling attention to the social realities of culture and heritage within situated and site-specific museum environments, and thus meeting the complexity of the current world. So to sum up, my argument here is 
that performance art challenges current museum pr practice because it is an ephemeral situated and site specific embodied art form. I propose atmosphere understood as an aesthetic and phenomenological phenomenon and the development of atmospheric con competence as a strategic tool in the process of documentation of performance art within museum environments. I then touched upon how documenting performance art from the dynamics of atmosphere enables a hybrid museum praxis which is holistic and inclusive because it is based on acknowledging diverse and embodied knowledge systems, hereby enhancing museums' advanced knowledge economy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ada. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lundegaard. That's uh, uh, what a complex situation you have presented. But yet, <laughs> as we listen to you, it's like, you know, uh, there's a living, a creative performance, the whole notion of atmosphere. Um, you know, there are a range of questions that come to mind, and I'm sure that our participants will have a lot of questions. But now okay. we'll move on to um, Professor Bindu Badana. Over to you, Professor Badana. Thank you. Uh also, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone attending this session from wherever, wherever they are in the world. I would like to begin by thanking Professor Gala for inviting me to take part in this webinar. I would also like to thank my distinguished co-panelists for participating with me. So when we look at the title of this webinar, it is quite clear that all three words in the title tie in quite closely together. However, in order to understand how an ephemeral act of performance discursively engages with and leaves its traces in contemporary art, I will focus on some aspects of Indian artist Nikhil Chopra's practice. Uh, so before I go to Nikhil Chopra's practice, I'd just like to touch upon the idea of ephemeral art when it began to enter mainstream art practice. So in Western art discourse, since the enlightenment, there has been a desire within society to create what we can see, touch, and experience within a static image. The attempt to capture passing moments in art sought permanence or at least a longevity. However, by late 20th century, art began to embrace ephemerality, a shift that largely occurred post-World War II. Artists responded to this possibility of total annihilation by rejecting permanence, and turning towards radical underground practices. Therefore, Dada and groups like Fluxus embraced ephemeral works that included performance and time-based events, much like the series of happenings, for example. So the idea of creating art for its own sake was explored through to the 1970s, about the decade that Nikhil Chopra was born in Calcutta in India. Chopra is an artist who performs durational site-specific performances, focusing on the idea of transformation. And it is through Nikhil Chopra's performances that I would like to add another key term to uh, the three word title, and that is contemporaneity. Contemporaneity or the idea of multiple times being lived together is a useful lens with which to view contemporary art. It is not only a more inclusive term in the way we can relate to art practices all over the world, but it also tangles with the idea of ephemerality, especially in Chopra's work as he recreates moments from past histories, often uh, through donning elaborate costumes uh, to transform into different personas. So as he goes back in time, he is simultaneously also connecting with the present. For example, in his performance during the Manchester International Festival in 2013, Chopra began his performance dressed as a cotton farmer, dragging a heavy cotton tent through the floor of the Whitworth Gallery which he then singly erected into a cotton shirt tent. As he proceeded to draw the visible landscape on one side of the tent, which is his usual style of working, his charcoal covered self transformed into a cotton mill worker and he exited the performance dressed as a Lancashire mill owner, all within a span of 65 hours. So the references in this work were several and contemporaneous. He was the present day cotton farmer from India struggling to survive. He was also the prosperous mill owner from 18th century Britain, making endless profits from a trade in cotton. In his performances, therefore, Chopra not only addresses a time-space continuum, but also the localized history of the space he inhabits. Through the performance, he creates a very direct dialogue with history, 
raising questions for everybody, not for the art world or for clever people, but for everybody. Notions of gender, power, and ownership are questioned through the performance itself. Equally important is the viewer's presence, their own memories and their subjective understanding of any moment, all of which combines to create the entire experience of a performance. The entire aesthetic not only relies on the performance site itself, but also on its location. So for example, if he's performing at an art festival or a Biennale, uh, the attention span of the viewer is definitely shorter than if he were to perform in a gallery or museum space, which is dedicated to mainstreaming his performance. To a viewer in an institutional space like the latter, paying concentrated attention to an artist who is sometimes drawing, sometimes eating, or sometimes washing, the will to wait can become an act of patience. Therefore, waiting, memory, and consciousness are all interwoven. Working closely with Umberto Eco's idea of how the atmosphere creates the conditions of perception, Chopra's partially choreographed performances are carefully staged to convey the aesthetic quality almost of a theater set. So for example, as Yogra Chitrakar, a series that he did a couple of years ago, which he finished a couple of years ago, for example, he often jogs post-colonial memory by staging carefully laid out objects such as an enamel basin and a jug that he then uses to wash and erase his charcoal covered blackness. Blackness with its many connotations. He is often the colored native, civilizing himself through dress, through manners and rituals as he sets himself food and wine on a table and carefully eats in a very civilized fashion during a performance, whether at the Venice Biennale or at the Centre Pompidou in 2011. The highlight of each performance is the charcoal drawing of the landscape he creates. He does this almost in most of his performances. Uh, this is, the, the drawing then becomes a trace of his ephemeral presence. And uh, it usually only remains for the duration of the, the exhibition, though this has started to change recently, but uh, I won't go into that now. So how might we understand a performance if we were not there or alive at the moment of its creation? When a document or the relic of a performance is shown in a gallery or museum, we are depriving the viewer of the original experience of the artwork. But then is some experience of a work better than no experience at all? To answer this last question, I will turn towards Nikhil Chopra's performance at Document of 14 in Kassel, Germany in 2017. For this performance, he undertook a road trip, uh, uniting uh, the two venues of Documenta, that is Athens and Kassel. And he traversed nearly 2,500 kilometers, crossing the mountainous landscape of Greece, monasteries in Bulgaria, uh, a national park, and art spaces in Sofia, Budapest, and Bratislava. His tent became a temporary studio and refuge where improvisational encounters unfolded in a sense of shared camaraderie. At every stop, he would make a drawing on the walls of what he saw outside of it. And by the time he arrived in Castle, he had created eight drawings on four canvases that were then displayed along the railway platform of Castle's former underground railway station, which is one of the venues, the, the Kultur Bahnhof. This 30-day performance resulted in a massive archive from this project, including installation, costumes, props, fabrics, drawings, and videos. And these were, of course, later on displayed in two exhibitions at Mumbai and San Gimignano in Italy. Uh, however, could these convey the atmosphere, the ephemeral reality of the performance? Uh, clearly, the issue of collecting and conserving art considered to be transitory and ephemeral is a difficult one. So while technology may offer some solution to capture the impactful experience, the line between performance art and video art then starts to get blurred. Performance art is all about preserving a memory of a viewer's experience. I would therefore argue that the trappings of a performance, especially its digital capture on video, if sufficiently immersive, can provide us just with about a glimpse of the performance, they cannot stand in for the live moment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Badana. So, in fact, we got to be present. Our experience has to be site-specific, if you will, to really appreciate and uh, enjoy your you know, experience performance art. 
Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to you. I'm sure there are a lot of questions coming up. But uh, we'll now move on to our final panelist. Um, Dr. Chaube, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Amar, for this opportunity. I had, I think, uh, for all good reasons, kept myself muted, you know, such a reminder that I need to unmute myself. <laughs> Eight minutes surely is a very long time <laughs> listening to both Ida and Bindu. And, uh, but anyway, it re really, it's really been um, mm, quite an eye opener. Uh, very insightful presentations by both Ida and uh, Bindu. Um, my take, I'm just looking at the three words uh, that uh, we have been given. One, of course, is ephemerality. The second is performance. And it's all, uh, both of these words, both of these terms have to do with art. And um, in my experience, although uh, I just dabble in art and uh, read about art, I think, and I'm not really conscious about uh, what I'm doing and whether it constitutes art or whether it could be defined as art. Um, I am just living. I'm, I'm just trying to make sense of life to me and I'm trying to make sense of myself um, using all my experiences, which would include all that I have learned, all that I have not learned, you know, my knowledge, my non-knowledge. Um, I'm just trying to make sense of things. I'm just trying to articulate my understanding of uh, um, the context. And it's this articulation, which uh, by some people would be looked upon as being art, by some, it would just be a mundane expression. By some, it could be an economic concern. By some, you know, it could be a different kind of concern or an articulation. So art, I think, is, of course, a construct. You know, somebody has to define a particular uh, expression or articulation as being an articulation of art. Um, but like I said, you know, so there are so many things that I'm drawing from and all these things have kind of integrated in me. So I'm, I'm just a, um, a tapestry woven out of so many yarns coming from so many different sources, you know, of so many different colors. And uh, that's what art is, I guess. It's, it's how you look at things. Art also has a, a very crucial fuel to it, driver to it, which is uh, perhaps the most important thing is, is uh, the processing power that an individual would have uh, of uh, the, the, the ability, the ability to imagine, to reinvent, to reimagine something which is uh, um, so much out there every day, you know, the, the daily dry realities of life, but uh, uh, it's what makes an artist a person with disability, calling him an artist, it's what makes this person go beyond the, the drab, routine, mundane realities of life, what you do with what you're given. And you'd be able to do this only when you have been exposed to so many different streams and streets and channels and facets and aspects of life. If you have uh, kind of just stayed a specialist, you know, so refusing to look out at life from different windows. I wonder um, what that does to your ability uh, to make sense of life. How much of an artist then you would be. Um, I think artists usually, uh, and all that there have been so many who have been mentioned thus far, are people who have this tremendous capacity to look at the world to relook at the world and to make it new, this world of ours, to make who we are new, to make our context new uh, by reimagining a reality. This is something, you know, so that Martin Heidegger has also spoken about, you know, art is about, everyone has talked about it. You know, so, I, mean, I should not only point out, you know, Heidegger. Everyone is talking about renewing, you know, so looking at the world in a new way. 
um, Joseph uh, Schumpeter, the great economist, also talks about, you know, so the need, of course, he was talking in a different context, a renewal. So something that is being renewed, how ephemeral could that be? That's my question. What is going to perish is obviously going to be something which stops being relevant. And that is how literature, you know, so survives. You know, we are still are reading Beowulf. We are still reading, you know, say texts that come to us from um, centuries, you know, back. Um, but there are many that have really proven to be ephemeral, that that could not survive the changing context. So ephemerality will depend on you know, so how we are changing, how times are changing, how our understanding of our world is changing. So art and ephemeral, you know, uh, real art, real expression is always going to be uh, something which tugs at human existence, which connects with people, which connects with human life. And that is what performance is. That is what performance as a construct is. Life is a performance anyway. Uh, even we are trying, we are talking to our children, trying to make a point to them, we have to perform. We cannot just be, you know, uh, monotonous or uh, metronomic in our um, conversations. We keep performing. We are always performing, you know, whatever it is that we are doing, you know, unconscious of the fact, not really mindful that we are performing, but we are in order to make our point. We are performing. And um, this is the big realization that, uh, as Bindu pointed out, you know, kind of uh, comes to the fore uh, in the 20th century um, when... Um, mm, um, one of my favorites, you know, so that is the, 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 the shift that takes place, you know, so from the retinal to the conceptual. Um, Duchamp, Duchamp, I think, uh, yeah, Marcel Duchamp had, had, had talked about uh, this, this shift. Um, art that used to please us uh, till this point in time, second, uh, uh, the, the cusp between, you know, so the period of the first and the second world war, it used to please us because of what it did to our eyes. You know, it, we, it, stops, it stopped with um, it just the visual pleasure, you know, so the colors and the form and the lightness and the truth of representation, realism. And then there comes this massive shift, you know, uh, brought about by the disasters of the First World War, you know, emergence of Dadaism and, and the whole world exploding, the, the intellectual Big Bang, uh, that sort of happened at the turn of the 20th century, you had so many different um, knowledge domains opening up, you know, so there was psychology, anthropology, you know, quantum physics, everything which kind of exposed to us to, to the different facets of our life. Life was no longer that simple little thing that we lived. There were so, so many things uh, happening around us. Um, we, we were brought face to face, for instance, you know, say with this massive world, this, this fantastical world that was inside of us, the world that psychology or psychiatry um, revealed to us, the world of the subconscious. So it was a completely different new world and it was only uh, obvious that uh, bigger changes would happen. And that is when the conceptual emerges, you know, the fountain, Marcel Duchamp, the urinal, and uh, the, the, that, that's uh, an idea, but then this idea moves on uh, to different levels. Um, when you have Joseph Burrs, the Fluxus, as Bindu pointed out, you know, performance drawing in uh, from different uh, uh, activities, experiences, you know, so I would not call them art forms, you know, so there was music, there is performance, you know, so there is drama, there is uh, some, uh, artwork there, Jackson Pollock um, is also a performer, uh, action artist, action uh, painter, Jack the Dripper, for instance, he was called. Uh, then you have um, Joseph Boys, as I said, Fluxus, Chris Burden, and uh, died in 2015. Uh, so performance, um, Te Ching Sia, the, the one-year cage piece, and then you had uh, 
so many, the time clock piece, one year art pieces. What are these people, uh, Marina Abramovich? What are they doing? What are they trying to do? Where are they taking art? Is it ephemeral, the impact that they are making? Of course, it's all being documented. It's all being documented. It's all ephemeral. You know, it's not something that you could, you know, say, put up on, on your wall like this painting that you see here. It's, it's um, crystal, you know, and um, um, what was that great work? The, um, the California Beach. Uh, Bindu, you recall that work? Anyway, I'm, I'm forgetting it, you know, I'm just getting a little carried away. What I'm saying is Chris Burden transfixed, you know, say when he had himself impaled on the roof of uh, the beetle uh, or when he had himself, you know, say shot by a friend of his. What are they trying to do? Or his Chicago piece that, uh, and, and see the Taiwanese artist whom Marina Abramovich uh, called uh, the master. Uh, what, what are they trying to do? Where are they taking art? How is it conceptual? What these artists are trying to do is to really take art to the next level where it really becomes experiential from just being retinal, what pleases you. It really punches you. It, it makes the experience of life visceral for you. For instance, Chris Burden being shot. What was he trying to do? Before making any comment, now this was uh, a piece that he came up with, I think, uh, 1970 or so. That was when the Vietnam War was on. And um, there were so many young people, you know, say being wounded, killed, and lots of people just mouthing platitudes, you know, uh, going by the media report. Oh, this is so bad. Never having experienced pain. Lots of people do that. What he's trying to do is really understand what pain is like before he opens his mouth. And he would need people to understand pain. So just not talking about it, experiencing it, is what he is trying to do. Marina Abramovich, an artist is present. Just sitting there, you know, can you imagine that the presence of a human being? It's, it's transformative. This is real art that transforms you. And that is what these artists are trying to do. And in making such an impact through their uh, performances, they are really changing the audience, the individual who comes in contact with their articulation. Although it's not something that you can put up on your wall, but it's something that's never going to leave your heart and never going to leave your being as a human uh, individual. I think, uh, Art is always going to be relevant so long as people can connect with its human dimensions. Art that is ephemeral is art that has lost touch with the context. In, I'm, I'm talking in larger senses. And I would say art that is performance is only a construct because all life is performance. And it gets distilled by artists in a certain way, encapsulated in terms of uh, a statement, a performance like Joseph Beers trying to teach uh, art to a dead hair. I think that was the first performance that he came up with. It's a performance very much like a metaphor or any literary device that an artist would use, a poet would use, just to make a point, just to make an emphasis, just to make an impression, just to score a point. So I think, uh, I don't know how articulate I have been, but it certainly has been a performance. You, you've, been, you've been wonderful, Dr. Chauve. That's, that's wonderful. And the discuss the way you've taken us through. And um, uh, I, I think that, you know, there are questions coming to me on emails and various media. It seems people are using different media. Uh, uh, I, I just want to say one thing to some of the participants who are being a little bit, you know, sending messages saying participation certificates. We do not provide participation certificates. A certificate is based on assessment. There's no assessment in this webinar. So we cannot provide that. So please, if you will, uh, uh, refrain from sending those messages. 
they're coming on the screen. Uh, Dr. Chabe, you talked about renewal. You talked about renewal after First World War, for instance. And uh, uh, you also, uh, you know, talked about renewal subsequently. But the one thing about renewal now is that people are living, interacting in the digital domain. It's not like the kind of ways that people in the early part of the 20th century, or most of the 20th century, were in their own isolation during any kind of pandemic or war or disaster. And now people are still engaging. So what does renewal mean in a contemporary world people are still engaged with the rest of the world through the digital domain. Uh, do you think it will make a difference the way artists would progress uh, post-pandemic? <clears throat> well, everything is going to change. You know, human beings are going to change. You know, the commerce between the human commerce uh, is going to change. By commerce, I don't mean um, the economic uh, business. How we greet each other, how we look at each other, the distance that we would start keeping uh, from each other, you know, so greetings that we make. So all of this is going to change, of course, you know, um, how people are going to be viewed by others coming from where they are, you know, and going wherever they are, uh, how they are going to be looked or perceived by others. So all of this, of course, is going to change. Um, are, uh, I, I think, you know, say, how much are we going to travel? So all these things will change, I suppose. I hope they, they, these won't, mm -hmm. but, uh, and I'm sure that you also don't want these things to change. Nobody wants these things to change. We would just really want to stay human, but uh, uh, masked humans, um, breathing hard, you know, say, and just getting their glasses stained with uh, our breaths and stuff. But uh, renewal, we would, this is where, uh, you know, the notion of renewal comes into play. Whenever life becomes platitudinous or cliched, you know, whenever we get stuck in the mire of uh, uh, habits, habits, uh, where we stop thinking, where we stop uh, kind of challenging a status quo or an old practice, because we don't realize that this practice is old. Right? We become too complacent. That is where you need an artist. You need an artist, you know, say, in, in the weirdest of places. Uh, I'm sure that you, you know that at LHC, the, the Large Hadron Collider Geneva, you know, say out there, you know, there were residencies for artists. Because they make you think, they, they, would, they would look at something in such a bizarre way. Daniel Pink, you know, say one of the thinkers, is talking about... Uh, um, the need, um, not for an M M MBA, but for an MFA. Uh, Schumpeter is talking about, you know, say when he was around, you know, and uh, what he was saying was still new, that you need to, in order for the market, for your product, for the industry, for the, the this market system to operate, you need to always keep changing things, renewing everything. And that is why you have these phones, just for instance, you know, say all of, or each product has, um, needs to have this appeal of the new. Every six months, you have models changing. You need a renewal. You need to have a new perspective on life because everything around us is changing so fast. We are no longer living in the Paleolithic times. You know, in the days, for instance, 1.8 millions ago, you know, when you had uh, Homo habilis and the next, uh, you know, um, movement that happens, you know, so happens a million years later or 50,000 years later. You know, we are moving fast. And uh, we cannot afford to be living in this very fast-paced world, walking slow. You know, we, we would fall down. So we need to keep pace. We need to keep thinking. We need to keep challenging, um, you know, a cliched statement. We need to renew. That is what artists do. They keep questioning. They keep reimagining a new future, a new reality. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Chaube. Dr. Lundka, um, a question has come relating to the focus of art, performance, and spiritual and re religious representation. And, uh, uh, and it relates to the controversy that surrounded Marina Abramovich, uh, the way she, you know, there was the accusation that she appropriated 
Aboriginal spirituality and Aboriginal, uh, you know, symbolism uh, when she spent time with Aboriginal people in Australia. So in performance art, what happens when people are seen as appropriating other people's values and other people's, you know, spirituality? I think it's, it's uh, thank you very much for the question. I, th I think it's di difficult to come with, up with a general answer to this question, but um, Abramovich uh, did apologize for, 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 and have taken part in, in this debate. But um, I think it's very important. I think it's very important for that we have artists that are nomads, that we learn from each other's cultures and uh, communicate different uh, cultural practices and also uh, are open for cultural conflations. Uh, I think this is uh, very important right now also to to think of a sustainable future that we develop um, global solidarity and i think this is based on critical care empathy and uh, knowledge exchange uh, yeah i can i can't hear you i can't you 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 there's no sound. Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Rita. I think this whole question of appropriation is coming up again and again. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, in art in different forms, performance art, uh, spirituality. Uh, so that's why someone has raised the question about yes. performance, uh, uh, spirituality, and representation. And uh, the next question is, you know, I'll just read it out. It's easier, so I'm not misrepresenting. Uh, this is by Snehal. Our contexts are different. We are all in different, and it is interesting um, how our lives have changed. Today, all of you are virtually in my dwelling. Generally, we would have been in a place of study to listen to talk talks such as this. So how is the notion of context? Your only time, time is the... Uh, is the context space is lost? Please comment. So, I mean, like normally we would have been in a seminar room or a yeah. study place, whatever, to listen to a webinar like this. Mm -hmm. But yeah. now in the digital domain, we are, in one sense, to go back to Dr. Chabe, you know, we're all performing, right, in the digital space in a way. Yes. And uh, so, how does uh, space is lost. You know, we, we're only in, in one time, we are connecting, but the context of space is lost where we are. Yeah. So you see the, 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 the there's a problematic there, so. That, there's, a, there's, yeah, several problematics when we talk about performance art also. I, I think that um, what I was going to, to say with my presentation is that Perhaps uh, I, th I think that uh, the way uh, performance art is documented is very much inf influenced by a, a modernistic museum concept. And it's, uh, it's um, I think we need a multiple perspective. We don't only need uh, one, uh, one, one uh, documentation. And I think we should include include um, the 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 people the citizen who are uh, who are using museums as co-researchers and co uh, in co-documenting performance art and and also uh, like you you said in your introduction about um, the smithsonian and how they document the, what is going on now that they invite the people to to help documenting and you you are not um, satisfied with one uh, perspective. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> another question again to you, Dr. Lundegaard. Mm -hmm. As a museum professional, uh, what are your ideas about, you know, can we preserve performance artworks and create the atmosphere or the experience in a museum context? I mean, like you, yeah, you project. Yeah, yeah. 
this is this is what I've been doing research into, but I I didn't find enough uh, space to to elaborate on my analytical matrix um, that I developed for um, doing research, uh, collaborative research with guards and with the people in the exhibitions. I made an, an analytical matrix uh, making a distinction between space and place, thinking of a place as the museum context, the, the um, the institution, the landscape, the architecture, the collection, and space as the yeah the void space for exhibition where unpredictable new things happen, new exhibitions where the art, uh, the uh, the curatorial approach uh, is constituting a, an um, an unpredictable space and um, and then I pref uh, uh, I used um, performative also in ethnography and uh, collaborative uh, processes to to document the atmosphere in in a retrospective um, exhibition with uh, uh, Abramovitz's work and it it uh, it was an extremely productive and multifaceted uh, um, result from from this way of working with documenting performance art and thank uh, you. yeah thank you dr lundega that's uh, Professor Badana, you know, like how can that moment of post-coloniality coloniality or decolonizing moment, if you will, in Langshire Mills, uh, that performance, how can that be accessible, you know, to people in India who would never get a chance to go there, you know, to that, um, you know, Manchester, I think you mentioned. How do we make performance art that is about decolonization process accessible to different people in different localities of the world. Professor Badana? She's actually just I unmuting. Sorry, I was just unmuting. I was on mute. All right. Uh, so, uh, so that's uh, as i said about performance art the problem is uh, mainly this that when the when he performed during the festival what remains is actually um, uh, you know just the documentation of the performance on his own artist website so you know it's uh, the performance has been uh, completed and all you can do is read about it but in terms of understanding uh, decolonization or post colonization it's um, he, uh, Chopra has performed in India uh, at numerable uh, sites as well. So since the theme is around that, so uh, it is possible for, for people who haven't traveled to other performances to have actually been able to see something in some performance in Bombay or Delhi. Uh, so the performance is the only, uh, uh, only point of contact where you can actually see uh, the whole process. Beyond that, uh, the documentation uh, will then leave it to the understanding of the person who's going to be uh, viewing his website, maybe. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think there are a lot of issues with uh, biennales and triennals. Uh, uh, there are circuits in which there's, you know, very, the same artists are performing in different places, mm -hmm. and it's, uh, it's a challenge. And this is where I really love Kuchimusuri's Biennale because it's accessible to people, not just the elite artists and the art circles, artists to uh, local people and so on. And uh, uh, now the next question, I don't know who is going to answer this, either Professor Badana or Dr. Chaube. Uh, here is a classical Indian dancer uh, who has seen the renewal uh, of the modern classical dance. Uh, is this something ephemeral, considering, you know, that it's a renewal of classical modern dance, and it's a renewal, but not built on the problems of caste and class that so inform classical dance in a place like India? Uh, because this question also came up in the last webinar, uh, where most of classical dances in India are upper caste classical dances. Their renewal takes place, but the caste and contextuality 
and class is not understood. And there's a kind of elite cultural reproduction that's taking place. That's, so anybody who wants to answer, is, is this a problematic? Is this something uh, transient? Is this going to change? That's the question from, I don't know who it is, but if uh, you would allow me, I'm a, um, yes. So you're very right, you know, um, that um, expressions get codified and uh, they are floating or being practiced at different levels. One level, of course, is the supposed to be the refined level, the, the classical sophisticated uh, level, um, the codified thing, you know, where art is uh, uh, supposed to be articulated, practicing a grammar, you know, and how rigorously that has happened. And the other level, of course, you know, say, the, the, so there is this great tradition, there is this little tradition, you know, say, I have something happening, so-called little tradition, something happening at the ground level, the folk level. That is where everything gets born. And that, I think, is the real human um, level birth. That is where the first aspirations or expressions emerge. And not, this is raw. Like, um, um, and then, you know, so the process of um, refinement starts. This is a kind of... Um, and of course, you know, so something which is uh, belongs to the classical art, you know, will be considered highbrow, and the, the the notion that something that is folk is lowbrow, you know, this is something that has persisted. What you're pointing out here, what you just mentioned, was how um, this notion of elitism, you know, you could call it, uh, it give it that caste dimension, but it it it's certainly there, you know, what is it that you listen to? What is it that you read? What is it that you watch? Um, where do you travel? Kind of friends that you have, you know, and all of this is going to um, establish your identity in my eyes. How well, what kind of an accent do you have? Do you have this Cockney thing? Do you speak pigeon um, or uh, you are East Coast, you know, or you you are kings or queens English. So that is what we are talking about. And uh, my view is that whatever it is, whatever modifications, this uh, dance form, Rukmini Devi Arundel, for instance, you know, really changed the way um, one of the greatest uh, Indian dance forms, um, uh, Bharatnatyam, I think it is, um, how it was practiced, who it was practiced by, who it was meant for, and... Uh, the other aspects of this dance form. So that was completely changed. So my simple belief is, as I have said earlier, that if it's an art form that is going to connect with a reality which is going to endure the passages of time, if it believes in equality, in harmony, in peace, in love, in reason, it's something that will survive because it connects with the basic human need, which is of being treated equally, being loved, equal opportunities. It makes sense. So unless, you know, say we, we again, you know, kind of lapse back in the days of, say, Hitler when book burning, art burning, you know, there was this particular kind of art that uh, the degenerate art or whatever. So in, in retrograde times, everything, a change that is human will endure. That is what I think. Thank you, Dr. Chaube. There, there are a number of questions that have come beforehand, but also that are coming up now. All of them are referring to one thing, the, the enormous impact uh, of the current pandemic. So, how does one actually document? How does one understand? How does one express uh, empathy with the kind of poverty that's being created, you know, in, in, through art as a means? Um, so there's several people who are asking that. And how do you, how do you recreate? I mean, how, how can performance art actually recreate the kind of suffering, the kind of poverty that's being created by the pandemic? Not only in India, but in different parts of the world. 
is performance art and a way of actually dealing with this in a post-pandemic area? That's one of the questions. Anyone? <laughs> Bindu? Ida. 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 Yeah, but uh, I'm, I'm sure that I, I, I think that to me, uh, art is uh, communication and reflect the human condition. Abramovich, um, Abramovich said, uh, said uh, it takes some time before um, artists can respond to reality. Uh, art should not be recycling daily news. And uh, I'm sure that, um, I think that is true. And I think that this um, pandemic uh, will uh, result in 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 in, uh, in responses from a lot of artists and maybe also new types of collective art forms. And I think that what I have tried to emphasize with my middle atmosphere and the, and this approach is that that the, the social context of art and that art also. Um, um, derives from a, a social context, and we, I think, uh, the pandemic uh, also um, requires uh, solidarity, which means we should focus more on collaboration. And maybe it's not, uh, maybe we should stop <laughs> celebrating the artists and and also the, uh, acknowledge uh, collaborative art forms. Uh, yeah, that was just yeah. my. Immediate. I'd like to add something. Yes. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, I'd, uh, so I'd like to expand the discussion to include not performance art, but street mm -hmm. art, because that's where you actually see works, where artists are actually creating works which are around the, the pandemic. So you, mm -hmm. are, you have that kind of response out on the street. And um, it may not be, in, and in any case, a rarefied space is not the space where this crisis belongs. So uh, I think in terms of connecting with people, street art is a very good option for artists to communicate. And of course, as Ida said, collaborative work is also a good way to go. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Badana. Uh, uh, Dr. Chabe, do you want to add to, to what they've said? No, I would totally agree. And you know, I think collaboration is something which uh, will be more in nature of a fight back, you know, say when this pandemic is pushing us apart, you know, what's going to help us is to actually come together, you know, collaborate, work together uh, and stay human. And that, yeah. that's togetherness is being human, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Uh, there's a question here that also, because we're having this webinar series, the Heritage Matters webinar series are ongoing, there's a continuity, people are coming back to participate. So some questions, you know, resonate with some of the earlier questions as well. Uh, one of the things is that we're talking about contemporary art, uh, we're talking about uh, intangible heritage, um, and all these things, but we're pigeonholing them through policy formulations and so on. But in fact, you know, there's an old uh, you know, English saying, once a practice, twice a tradition. And uh, so we're constantly creating, you know, sort of our living heritage, and which informs the contemporary creativity. Uh, in fact, at one time when UNESCO was debating whether we should have one convention or two conventions, that is uh, 2003, dealing with the safeguarding of intangible heritage, 2005, uh, about the cultural contents and expressions in the world. They were originally meant to be one convention or then they became sister conventions. Now they've gone in two different directions. That's because uh, very strong French concern uh, in the drafting that where do we draw the line? Are we, will we forget that which is contemporary art? Uh, will not have anything to do with the traditional uh, are we, that which is traditional, we're going to pigeonhole as intangible heritage. So there was a very strong concern. Now, Ida, you know Marina Abramovich, uh, you've studied her, you've known her, you've done so much work. Uh, to a large extent, 
she has learned from the intangible heritage, the spiritual heritage, the Tibetans, the Aboriginal people and others. How do you think that she so beautifully transcended? Uh, give us an example how she transcended from that spiritual intangible heritage that she experienced and learned from and then created her own contemporary performance. Yeah. And, and also, I, I think it's important to add her own childhood, her grandmother, who was a Christian Orthodox, uh, and she experienced the totemic uh, um, uh, of uh, icons, icons who produced miracles. And she had a, an uncle who, who was a martyr, and she had her parents who were communists and also endured a lot of pain. She experienced the... Uh, a civil war on, on the Balkans that she, for instance, uh, reacted against. So, so there's so many different um, uh, types of intangible heritage that she incorporates in in her performance pieces that respond to contemporary issues, but are based on long uh, traditions. Like, like, for instance, also Zen Buddhism and the whole way she works with the breathing techniques to endure pain and uh, to, to, yeah, to explore the, the limits of um, her body. Yeah. Thank you. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. You, uh, how she transcends, you know, from yeah, but, that but I think it's well. very important to, to stress that we 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 have to go back again and again and use our heritage to to for rethink and uh, uh, find new languages to respond to contemporary issues. We can continue, mm -hmm. and I think, for instance, performance is a uh, very old tradition that is. Um, Absolutely. It's not something that was invented after the Second World War, but you know, you have in India a 2,000 year old tradition for dance performance and, and all these kind of uh, performances are extremely important for how we, we can think and be challenged by performance today. Yeah, thanks, Ida. I think you brought us back to the challenge of, you know, addressing what is contemporary. Mm. And uh, what is traditional, and uh, and th this debate will go on. Now there is a question that somebody is asking about safeguarding intangible cultural heritage. We're not going to answer it here because it's addressed to all the panelists. Who would ask? Who would ask the question? I have some really good news for you because the next webinar, just watch out. You'll get a notice because you registered for it. We're going to take you to Jodhpur to the National Intangible Heritage, Cultural Heritage Festival. Our next webinar is actually the festival itself. So your question, you know, if you could keep that question, you know, uh, till the next webinar, I would really appreciate it. But thank you for asking, because I think you anticipated our next um, okay. webinar. But Dr. Sky Morrison, who is a loyal, supporter of uh, Heritage Matters webinars from Toronto, uh, she basically makes a very straightforward common sense comment that Black Lives Matter is an intercontinental performance, mm -hmm. um, uh, ex which is in response to real time issues. Yeah. And, uh, and this is exactly what I started off with, how doc Dr. Lonnie Bunch three, you know, the secretary of the Smithsonian sees it as the protest itself you know, as a performance and wants it documented. Mm. And uh, so how are we doing it in India? Professor Badana and Dr. Chabe, how are we um, documenting the kind of protests or uh, issues in India? How do we document them? Will we forget them? Will we remember them? I mean, certainly the people who are suffering will never forget in their lifetime. Uh, well, um, in terms of art or in terms of politics, our media is doing it not in a very, uh, very uh, documentable way. That's one oh, way to look at it. That's and, really sad, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. And uh, beyond that, in terms of, I think we, uh, we have a lot to do. I think we need a much more focus on this 
in terms of how we could document these uh, for uh, archival reference as well, but also as participate, participatory uh, art, which is something that we haven't really had that much of a focus on in yeah. terms of art practices. Thank you. Dr. Chabe. Um, well, Amar, I think um, it has, of course, you know, so there must be artists out there who are trying to articulate and express um, the pain, the anger, the anguish, you know, that uh, everyone is experiencing, but perhaps it's not being documented and it's not being presented, you know, say in India, um, as in many other cultures, art doesn't really, it is hardly ever, you know, so foregrounded, you know, so it doesn't make news. So we are not really aware uh, of uh, how uh, active the artists are and what they are doing, but I'm sure that everyone is uh, uh, thinking, feeling the pain and articulating it. And uh, so this is what I have to say in response to your question, but I would just like to point out something, you know, in response to your previous question about tradition and uh, are abandoning the tradition in order to stay new. Um, and T.S. Eliot, for instance, I would just like to point out, you know, um, this was, this has always been a, a problem, you know, who is modern and um, mm. a perennial problem, very much like performance art not being, you know, say uh, a 20th century uh, in, invention, but it has always been there. We've always been performing, uh, whether it's uh, telling a story or uh, the troubadours or uh, the wandering minstrels, um, the miracle and the morality plays, whatever it is. So tradition and the individual talent is what I would uh, recommend everyone to read where Eliot um, at the turn of the century, again, 1920s, he is emphasizing on the need for a young artist to stay balanced. You know, um, there is this yearning of a new voice that he has. He wants to be different from others. But how different can you be? How individual can you be? How original can you be? Can you ignore the traditional? Can you ignore the past wisdom? Can you ignore Homer, Kalidas, Tulsidas, you know, Goethe? Can you ignore your past and tradition? No. So he is asking for a balance. And he says that a modern artist, an artist should always be writing with not just the past and the present, but also future in his bones. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, Yeats talking about, you know, what he is talking about in Byzantium, uh, that, that golden bird that sings not of what has happened, but is, is happening, but also of what is going to happen. Artists are visionaries. They have this ability to see into the future. And that is how they are different. That is how they make new. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Chabe. Ida, the next question is to you. Uh, mm -hmm. I forget the name of the artwork at Louisiana Museum of Modern Art. The question is the kind of police brutality and the ephemerality of it. Uh, can this be documented? Can this be represented in a museum. Uh, I forget, the, it was collected for document in 72, you'll recall the Ida. Can I have the spotlight on Ida, please? Uh, do you remember the collect, it was collected by Japanese associate, it was an artwork. The, the people brutalizing with the car, um, you know, a, a, you know, an African American was being brutalized. It was at the Louisiana Museum of Modern Art. And, oh uh, yeah, the, the the what's his name? <laughs> oh, I forgot. Yeah, the the lynching. lynching. Of, uh, yeah, yeah, Keenhouse. It was Keenhouse uh, installation from yeah, Dogmenta, 1972. That what 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 was the question? Yeah, he, I mean like. Uh, this was is that, you know does that show a way that uh, the kind of brutality that's yeah. performed you know when we're talking yeah. about black lives matter yes is, is there other ways of uh, creating the atmosphere in a museum about that brutality when we document yeah. and try to bring I, I, it I, 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 yes i'm sure yeah i'm sure there is and but i think that um, 
um, also as a response to um, Anun just uh, remarked before, I think it's we really need um, also museums as places to negotiate possible futures. I don't think we should leave it alone to individual artists to formulate the future. It was it it has to be a common. Um, responsibility and um, issue that uh, we should uh, ha have confidence that everybody can contribute to and negotiate. And again, I'm, I'm, I, I think that we need more focus on collective practices and collaborative practices. And I think that the 20th century has focused so much on especially male genius or you know back from the enlightenment and that uh, and the myth that art and thinking and visions can only be produced uh, in uh, alone and by uh, pr promoting the individual and uh, I think we need something else I don't think this strategy has mm, worked that well our economical system is collapsing and the world is uh, becoming more and more in unequal and um, so we we are desperate for 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 new provisions and and new um, uh, ima uh, to ima uh, and spaces where we can imagine other futures and not just one future i think the world is so complex and we now realize that uh, we don't need one truth anymore. Finally, capitalism has also shown, and a neoliberal um, economy is not uh, is that's not uh, working um, either. So that that is not. Uh, I, I think we have to stop <laughs> longing for for one answer. But and that's what I also wanted to to emphasize with the, my practice of documenting uh, atmospheres, the social the social context of art in in museums as a way to negotiate uh, plural and multi vocal um, ideas and voices. And uh, in this way, we we can emphasize a much more deep and complex um, thinking and understanding of our common what what our common wealth is and how we can improve the world and more a more just and and uh, equal world for and take care of the environment and all these things that yeah. are Did I, challenging uh, us right now yeah Ida, you you've studied as far as i know more than anyone else you know sort of the users in museums art museums young yeah. people more than anyone else in Europe and published extensively. Um, now, one of the things that we, we are saying in India, for example, maybe in Europe too, uh, de-urban, you know, very strong advocacy for de-urbanizing because urbanization has been such a one-way process, globalizing yeah. process that people are moving back into villages, uh, get away from the urban. But as people move away, you know, these big sites of uh, art museums and performance and uh, museums, they also will have to uh, be, become networks, if you will. And uh, so how, I mean, like in India, we face this as a huge challenge. And somebody has asked the question that uh, we have this uh, time to reflect, you know, during the, pandemic lockdown in India. I'm not asking this question to you, Ada, but also other panelists. Yeah. Um, is this really going to help, you know, for people to rethink the notion of the museum as something living and dynamic? Has performance art got a role to play? Uh, this is what someone is asking that question, I, because I don't yeah. have names of people here. Yeah. Yep, yeah, but I can, should you I ask? answer from yeah, Denmark's yeah. point of view? I, I think that um, I, I think we really need uh, also based on all the user studies we have done in in public museums here in Denmark, we, we really need to, in my point of view, my personal point of view, to to do something about this uh, 
very unequal uh, access and engagement in in museums we have and and it requires i think a new model we we have we have had all these policies for inclusion and um, outreach and uh, it doesn't make any sense because uh, museums are based on a capitalistic and experience economic model and um, I think that if we want museums who focus on the future and that are common spaces for knowledge production, we have to allow them to, to, to develop in this direction and also based on and also in enabling them to include and in be focus on people's knowledge and experience and include this in their museum praxis. It, it, it needs uh, another econ uh, economic model and museum model that, that, I, that I propose that we could call a, hy a hybrid museum model. Thanks, Ida. Uh, Bind, uh, Professor Badana, there's a very uh, specific question for you. I think it's coming from somewhere in Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, so, virtual museums as digital collection complexes. A museological perspective using the example of Hans Gross Criminal, Criminal Museum. Dr. Bindu, please do tell us how can we uh, document art forms through virtual museums in Germany, including okay, I, performance. <laughs> okay, that's, I, I'm not aware of the museum, so I would not be able to comment on exactly Hans Gross's criminal museum, but in terms of being able to uh, create virtual museums documenting performance art, I think that is something that we all have to engage with much more seriously with this point in time, because I don't think... Uh, that uh, museums as such and uh, how, how much longer it will take for the museums, uh, the whole museum culture to come back the way it was, uh, to my, uh, according to my understanding, is not even an option for us today. And in any case, I think the main point that I was, uh, when you were talking to Ida about, um, about the kind of museum post-pandemic or what are the possibilities, I was just thinking about how it should change and how uh, we need to have a very different kind of understanding of museums as not elite spaces, but spaces which engage directly with local cultures. Um, in terms of virtual museums, I, I think the experience is not an easy one because, uh, we, you know, there are so many experiences that are let, left out of that experience. The whole idea of a museum experience is to actually go to a space and to be able to interact with the artworks or with the performance and uh, get the sense of uh, the whole uh, atmosphere, as Ida has been mentioning. Yeah. And um, with a virtual museum, uh, uh, a lot of these uh, aspects will be left out. And uh, uh, I, I, don't, I think it's not that easy to imagine a future of just a virtual museum, whether in Germany or anywhere else because it leaves a lot of, uh, a lot of us who deal with art, uh, you know, uh, uh, we feel that uh, that will not be a satisfying experience in any case. I'm sure somebody else can well, add some more to it. Yeah. I, uh, before I get to the final question, which is addressed to all the three of you, I just want to mention to the participants that the next webinar takes you to a, a different space for the webinar. We're using a blended approach to take the webinar or Heritage Matters webinar to the a Desert Museum near Jodhpur in Rajasthan. And uh, so uh, please do join us. But before we finish, I want to ask all the three of you, uh, I think the whole question of being site specific, you know, all the three of you have mentioned in one context or the other, being site specific. And Bindu, you just mentioned about, you know, away from virtual museums, the whole idea is actually um, going to the museum, the experiences, you know, which is site specific, mm -hmm. right? So, what does site specific mean in performance art? How important is it? So, uh, can I start? So, 
Yeah, sure. Uh, site uh, site specificity in performance art does not necessarily mean a museum, right? So, yeah, with performance sure. art, it can be any space. It can mm. be a Kochi Museum is Biennale. It can be any Biennale. It can be also a art fair or festival. It could even be a, a part of a traveling exhibition. It could even be a you know a small gallery doing a, a, a kind of site specific performance. So um, site specificity and performance, of course, um, are not necessarily in elite spaces. That's one. So in that sense, uh, uh, the performance and site specificity, according to my understanding, is, is directly linked. And of course, I think each artist, when they choose a space or a space chooses them, whichever way it goes, uh, it's um, it is actually the context of the whole work, right? So it's important uh, for the site to be specific to the performance mostly, and there is always a correlation. And it's uh, I don't know if yeah. that's uh, exactly the answer it, that uh, you're looking for. But, uh, yeah, no, no, I'm not. Uh, it, it's your participants asking you <laughs> questions. And uh, Ida, do you want to address that because you always talk about site specific? From from a uh, from a from an atmospheric point of view, site uh, the site sensitivity or the site specificity is determining for how the the artwork. I would say, like I think we uh, agree, Bindu, that uh, of course, it, for instance, with Abramovich, he's reenacting our young artists are reenacting her works and. When you reenact a, a, a performance, it, it's a new it's a new artwork, and uh, the context, uh, the site is determining together with the people who are there, and that's why I, I advocate that we should have many different documentations from performances, not only one. It's not sufficient that the artist or the museum have one doc uh, or some documentations from. Um, uh, 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 performances we are missing out, out on so much knowledge uh, that if we if we share this um, this uh, process with others and it really demonstrates how important this uh, the site is for uh, performance art. thank you dr chabe yes i think you know the site is quite important and uh, as, as Ida says and i totally agree with her and that it should be documented in different contexts. You know, so you can't say that there is only one context, uh, uh, there's only one site, which uh, is perhaps the most impactful. Uh, there could be many sites, and then we should have these performances in different sites and document them, and then you know, uh, take a call on which one makes most uh, um, impact. And it's true, not just of performances, it's true of uh, any articulation. It could be literary, it could be artistic. How are you? These are iterations. So if you just imagine uh, the shamans, the Paleolithic world, you know, so the ancient world and the shamans yeah. uh, or the cave dwellers inside the cave, the acoustic. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know the the resonance of it, you know, storytelling or performances, you know, the magic of the light and the shadows. That that's, is a site. That's right. Doing it it in your job, living room, you know, under these white lights, Amar. You know, it won't be the same magic. It won't be the same impact. Yeah. But it could be elsewhere. It could be next to the field under a tree. So site is important, and not keep trying with site. Yeah. yeah, thank this you. Is all. Site I, is important. Think, keep trying yeah. out new sites, keep making it new. Never be satisfied with what you have. You know, so that's yeah. the lesson. Yeah, keep thank you. I think that what you see futures, new idea. Yeah, I know we're over there. And, and my position, by the way, Amar, it has changed because you, you would have made out I'm struggling. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me, Ida? Yeah, we I can all Dr. hear you. I can hear you. Hmm? Dr. Ch Ida, you can. Okay, one last question. I think we lost Dr. Chabe, you know, because uh, 
internet issues there. Uh, one last question. Um, it's, it's actually not addressed to Ida, but it's inspired by Ida. Uh, this is based on a publication of Ida about a very famous Indian theater artist who is actually in one of the participants, Dr. Vijay Bhaskar, mm. who spoke uh, who spoke as one of the panelists during our last webinar. He says, quite rightly, performing artists in the past are seen as the voice of the voiceless, human rights activists, moral role models. Why has it been so difficult for artists these days to be in this category? Hmm. Since that's you wrote about his work, do you want to answer first? Yeah, but that's fantastic. Uh, I I don't know what to say. I just, I just think that it's, it's so important that we got this uh, viewpoint so clearly expressed by Dr. Vishabaska. And I, I love his uh, literature and his poetry. And thank you very much for finishing. Asking the yeah, asking this question. Uh, Professor Badana, do you want to make any comments <laughs> about it? Uh, I. Uh, I think in terms of why there, why we have lost that kind of performance in terms of uh, uh, powerful performances in terms of making statements. Uh, I think uh, there are, there are those statements being made. They are happening. It's just that they are not, uh, not in the mainstream and they exist. It is, it is up to all of us to try and bring them into, uh, you know, make those voices heard and uh, bring them into the, Central Thank you, Professor Badana. You hit the nail on the head because the media is not interested, our middle class intellectuals are not interested. Uh, the problem is about literacy among those people that are meant to be literate about you know, these kinds of performances. Uh, mm -hmm. Anane, I would really love to hear from you about this because I know, uh, you know you transcend many borders when you deal with art, poetry, and so on. And I'll read out the question because I want to finish with, <laughs> with uh, Dr. Chaube. Uh, performing artists in the past are seen as the voice of the voiceless, human rights activists, moral role models. Why has it been so difficult for artists these days to be in this category? Dr. Chaube? Uh, it's, it's not difficult for artists at all. Artists Can I have the spotlight on Dr. Chaube, please? Things, doing things, expressing themselves. Can I have the spotlight on hmm. Dr. Chaube, please? Well, I've been pushed away in a corner. So, you know, it's because <laughs> of... Uh... Sharvari, can I have the can spotlight on Dr. Chaube? Yeah, there. Well, yeah, don't move yes, your sir. hands because when you move your hands, Okay. The, the camera is freezing. <laughs> Unfortunately, don't perform. Don't perform. Yeah, exactly. You don't want me performing. Well, Amar, to, to, in response to your question, I would like to say that artists everywhere, you know, say they are um, expressing themselves. They cannot not uh, express what they are feeling. And these are very sensitive beings, same as anyone else. But the only that they are expressing like IYY in, in China, you know, they're all expressing, but just either, you know, they, they are being suppressed, whatever it is that they have to say, or as you pointed out, as that Bindu pointed out, it's not being recorded. No one is interested. You know, then the, the, we, we did not grow up in a culture where uh, art is taken seriously. Um, and that's what we are, uh, faced with that's that's the reality we are living so there are people speaking a language that we cannot understand and since we cannot understand you know so the best thing for us is to ignore it you know we become deaf to it or we become blind to it that's that's what we are doing we we don't have enough consciousness we don't really have enough uh, training in us to make us understand to first listen to what's happening to register what the artists are saying Right. Yeah. And uh, that's the reason why much of what is being said, much of what's happening is not reaching us. The media is not interested, but yeah. good work is happening. Poets are writing, artists are expressing themselves, performance artists are, 
you know, performing, thinkers are thinking, everything is happening. It's just that it's not reaching the majority who are not really trained or interested. They have other problems to deal with. There are other things being reported. And Dr. Chaube. And I do not move my hand. Dr. Chaube, I know we're over the time, but this is being recorded. It'll be uploaded. So people will listen to it. Uh, I came back after 43 years back to India. And in the last five years, what I've, I've worked extensively with architects, designers, and planners. And what shocked me, you know, with all these graduates from prestigious architecture schools, design schools, planning schools in India, is that they had no sensitivity to performance, to art, creativity. I was really shocked. Uh, the notion of aesthetic is, is alien. Uh, I also taught at the School of Planning and Architecture, Vijayawada. I ran two studio uh, uh, classes for architecture students. And one of the things that they always said is, they're not actually taught about aesthetics. They're not taught, taught about the, uh, the human dimension of architecture, design, and planning. And uh, one of the reasons why I'm attracted to come to Anand National University, I was going back to Australia, is that you offer a vision of softening, you know, this kind of harsh edges of architecture, design, and planning, uh, where creativity, performance, the sensibilities of the indigenous knowledge systems are rarely, rarely addressed. Um, and uh, and you, as a provost, you show an enormous passion that you really want to create an interdisciplinary environment where these things are addressed. Would you like to finish off by saying, because after all, you're the host of these webinars, uh, what your vision is, how do you, how do you, uh, sorry, from Canada, I'm getting the message saying that keep the discussion going because it's recorded. <laughs> but, but Anane, would, would Dr. Chaube, would you like to express your vision as to how do you, how can Anand become, uh, you know, like a site, an educational space, they, whether they're graduates of architecture, planning, uh, the, sorry, design, when they leave, they leave with those sensibilities, you know, that ability to appreciate the aesthetic, which I'm sorry to say, some of the most famous consultants, architecture consultants, design consultants, that I've come across in this country since I've come back are insensitive. Uh, of course, you have the exceptions like Brinda Sumaya, who is incredibly sensitive, incredibly you know, passionate about bringing the human dimension. But people like Brinda Sumaya are so rare. So how do you, I mean, what is your vision? I mean, how do you want to take the institution forward? Well, my vision, Amar, is very simple. Um, and, and it connects with what the point that you made earlier. Spotlight on Dr. Chauvet. Uh, uh, you know, kind of I, I don't know, yeah, because you're sitting away from the camera when you move your hands. Your camera is struggling. Yeah. Can yeah. you hear me? We can hear you if you don't move. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So I I would need our students to become self-aware and context aware. Yeah. All right. So what I'm saying here, my, my wish is most of us, you know, come from a background where being linear is, is always privileged. Um, it's the only view of the world that you have. And that's a very limited vision of the world. I have always been a supporter of developing capacities in, in a kid. Let the kid do a as many things, let the kid look out of as many windows, 
in the world as possible. Let the kid, let the children, let young people, let everyone develop as many perceptions as could be developed about this world of ours, about oneself. Develop your capacity. And this is where yeah, we've lost you. We've lost you, Anandaya. Maybe you turn off your video so that we can hear you at least. Hey, this is where the limitation is. We are not sufficiently self-aware. We are not context-aware. Uh, living in a place which is limited by climate. And this is something that could only be corrected if we understand ourselves better and we understand the world better. And that happen. Um, well, so what I'm saying... Yeah. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah. Hello. Yes, Hello. yes, yes. yes Hello. Can hear. Hello. Yeah, keep going. Hello is we should allow our students to discover themselves and discover the world by exposing them not to just one subject, not to help them become a specialist, but to understand the context. And that will only happen when they have access to different knowledge domains. Let them explore the world and let them understand themselves. That is what I in, intend to do. And that is something which you all intend to do. This is where you all come from. You know, you, you have uh, a comprehensive understanding of the world, a vision of the world. And that is what everyone should have. That is what my vision is. It's as simple as this. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Amar. Did you hear yeah, me? Thank you. Yeah, we heard you. Thank you so much. And uh, okay. Ida, before you disappear into the Nordic world, Nordic dark light, <laughs> uh, is, is there one la last comment you want to make? Because we are recording this, so yeah. uh, even though people are logging out, there are a lot of people who log in and listen later on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you see there are a number of webinars that are scheduled at the same time from Paris. So it's made it difficult yeah. for us. Yeah. You know, because, uh, yeah, okay. One last comment. It has been wonderful to take part in this webinar. And I think it's so important and inspiring that we have these uh, webinars ac across continents and, and learn and debate with each other. And I, I learned so much from this. Thank you so much for having okay. me. Professor Badana. Yeah, uh, before I thank you, I would just like to add that I think our endeavor should really be to make art rather than an elite domain, a very inclusive domain across mm. all countries, across all spaces. And if we work with that vision and we can help to create that, that would be a very, uh, it would be useful for all of us. And uh, thank you so much. I'm very happy to be part of this uh, panel. Ananaya, if you can still, uh, if you're still there, you want to make one last comment? Uh, I would just like to thank everybody here. Yeah. You know, I think it's really been uh, uh, a very yes. useful and insightful yeah. discussion. Thank, thank you, everybody, for attending this. And uh, we'll really look forward to more such sessions where we keep exploring hide and seek. So thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all, everyone who attended it. It's been an, an insightful uh, experience session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all the panelists. It's been... Um, Sharvari, have you logged? Are, are we still on? Yes, we're on. I can't see either Professor Badana. Can we're you on. focus? Oh, there's Ida. 
Ida and uh, Dr. Lundegaard, Dr. Professor Badana, Dr. Chauve, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate it. And, um, uh, but please do join us on those of, those are the, some of the people who are still there as participants, especially Dr. Sky Morrison and a whole lot of others. Uh, please join us next webinar, which, we, which will not be from my bedroom where I'm sitting, but it'll be from the, <laughs> from the Desert Museum near Jodhpur in Rajasthan. That's where it's going to be. And uh, we all, we look forward to welcoming you all. Thank you very much and uh, be safe. Uh, it's time for reflection and uh, think of a better tomorrow and new ways of engaging, new ways of doing things. Thank you for your time, we really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Lundegaard, Professor Badana, Dr. Chaube, thank you all.